tossed by waves of failure Almost drowned in shame's deceit But underneath the wild waters You are a deep and solid peace But I Gift 
God who still surprises us in ways we never thought. You're my help and you're my healer. You're the well that won't run dry. All I am needing, you will provide. I've never known your word to be unfaithful. I've never seen one of your saints forsaken. Palm Sunday, where we remember how Jesus made his way into Jerusalem and in doing so made a way for the whole world to be saved. A special week, we're gonna sing about Jesus being the one who always makes a way. Teach you a song, it goes like this. 
standing here Not knowing how we'll get through this test But holding on to faith you know best Nothing can catch you by surprise You've got this figured out You're watching us now When it looks as if we can win You wrap us in your arms and step in And everything we need you supply You've got this in control And now we know that you made us When our backs were against the wall And it looked as if it was over You made a way And we're standing here Only because you made a way Jesus, you made We're here Looking back on where we come from Because of you and nothing we've done To deserve the love and mercy you've shown But your grace was strong enough To pick us up And you made us When our backs were against the wall And it looks as if it was over You, you made a way And we're standing here Only because you made a way Made a way When our backs were against the wall And it looks as if we was
And we're standing here only because you made a way. You're standing here only because you made a way. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Jesus, help our lives to yes, match Lord. up with your way. Yes, Lord. Direct our steps in your way. We think of everything going on right now in our own lives, in our families, in this world. We need you to make a way. We have confidence that you will because it's what you've always done. It's who you are. You're the way maker. We welcome you today, way maker. Come make a way. Amen. Good morning, Grace. I'm coming to you online from the stage at Grace Snellville, along with a skeleton crew of brave production and camera operators, not numbering more than 10 and all appropriately socially distant. I'm also seated between two house palms because it is Palm Sunday. Maybe you, as you watch from wherever it is that you're watching, want to gather up. If you have a house palm or two, you could just bring it around to kind of recreate the mood of Palm Sunday just a little bit. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to one of the classic Palm Sunday texts, John chapter 12. And while you turn there, I want to give you a definition of a word, and that word is disappointment. Disappointment is when we are unhappy because someone or something was not as good as we hoped or expected, or it's because we're unhappy because something simply did not happen at all. Now these days, there's a lot of disappointment in the air with all of the stay-at-home requirements in response to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. There are all kinds of cancellations, postponements, limitations on where we can go and what we can do. Birthday parties are being canceled. Weddings aren't happening. Even funerals are not able to occur with numerous people in one place. Next week is Easter. We'll be celebrating Easter online in this same format and on one of our staff Zoom calls this week, because everything has become a Zoom call meeting, I was talking and Rebecca Raudebush, who usually is in our foyer greeting everyone, was just lamenting that this year for Easter, we won't be gathering here at sunrise, baptizing people and just getting to see all of your faces and eat donuts and celebrate together. Now, we will celebrate Easter big time when we're able to gather again in one place. But until that time, she was just saying, I'm just disappointed that Easter isn't going to look like we've come to expect it to look year after year. So here's the exercise I'd like you to do. I want to see your best disappointed face. So wherever you're watching it, uh, whoever you're watching, engaging with this gathering right now, uh, go ahead and show them your best disappointment face. So this picture of a dog online, kind of a disappointed face. Now the big question about disappointment is how do we deal with it? And this question is huge. As we'll see in the scripture this morning, the crowds who initially greet Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem with great enthusiasm, they experience deep disappointment with Jesus and they don't know how to deal with it and so it actually leads them to reject Jesus by the end of the week. And the same is true for us. If we don't learn how to handle disappointment, to deal with disappointment well, it can have massive personal and spiritual effects in our lives. In fact, I've seen, and maybe you have too, people who have walked away from Jesus because of this very issue, disappointment. 
So let's begin reading John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign, raising Lazarus from the dead. Now the reason this particular text is so helpful with the issue of disappointment is because it is so full of expectation. I want to show you a very simple equation. Disappointment equals our expectations minus our actual experience. So, if we have very high expectations and a very low or poor experience of that thing, it would create a lot of disappointment. And I know, you're looking at this equation, you're saying, I'm already doing enough digital learning days at home. Don't give me more math in a sermon. But I think this can help us grasp the concept of disappointment. So for example, over the weekend, we had to send out communication that Camp Kids Life won't be happening in May. And so many of you are excited to send your kids. Your kids are through the roof, high expectations Now there's no experience, just a cancellation. That's the sort of thing that can create a great amount of disappointment. I've also spoken with a number of students, particularly seniors in high school and in college. And they were looking forward to the second semester of their senior year. Get to relax into a little senioritis, get past those what's next decisions for the most part, college and career and And just enjoy being with friends and riding out the end of that season. But now that school won't be meeting again this year, well, the experience relative to those expectations is quite low. Huge disappointment. The same formula works with movies. I remember when Indiana Jones 4 came out a number of years ago now. I was so excited. I grew up, I loved Indy. I wore, when I went to see Indiana Jones 4, I wore my fedora to the movie theater. I mean, I was amped. My expectations were ridiculously high. But if you've seen it, you know, it was a profoundly dull movie leading to very deep disappointment. This is not the case with every movie. I went to see How to Train Your Dragon when it first came out. I had pretty low expectations, but it turns out it's a remarkably entertaining movie. I loved it. And I still kind of like to watch it. I mean, I I use the excuse that maybe my girls want to watch it now, but really, it's just me. I like it. Toothless, Night Fury, Dragon, awesome. So there are situations where we have low expectations and have great experience, and, and actually, it reverses the disappointment. We're overjoyed. We're happy. One more example, some of you may remember, Super Bowl 51. In the third quarter, the Falcon fan expectation was fully assured that Atlanta would be bringing home a title. The score was 28-3 to in our favor. But then the experience of the final score, and I won't even say it out loud, was so horrible that it resulted in enough disappointment that some of my closest Atlanta football fan friends wouldn't even talk about the NFL for months afterwards. So disappointment, disappointment. What about the crowds here in John chapter 12? What's their expectation? And from the text, we see that it is through the roof. They are expecting huge things from Jesus. He resurrected Lazarus after Lazarus was dead and buried for four days. So they're looking at Jesus as one with incredible power. But they also had an agenda to their expectation. 
the very well-known refrain of Palm Sunday, Hosanna. It comes from Psalm 118. You have the text here on the screen down below. It says, save us in Psalm 118, verse 25. Hosanna is the word. Hosanna, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. It's the same verse that they quote in John chapter 12, verse 13. It says, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now notice that last little bit, even the king of Israel. It's not in Psalm 118. They've added that on Palm Sunday. Why? Because they have an agenda. They want Jesus to be their king. Now Jesus, so far in the Gospel of John, has not responded very well to that kind of agenda. Back in John chapter 6, it says that he believed they were going to try to make him king by force, and so he immediately withdrew. But these people, these crowds, they're expecting Jesus to be their king. To not just be the king of the kind of kingdom that Jesus is talking about, but to specifically address the issues that they were dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Because remember, to be a Jew living in that part of the world, in their own land in that time, under the Roman Empire rule, meant that you had to pay exorbitantly high taxes. The healthcare system was almost non-existent. And you were limited in the way you could practice your religion. The Romans were always keeping an eye on what you were doing. And finally, If the Romans asked you to do anything, you basically had to drop whatever you were doing to do what they asked you to do. So you were living in kind of this almost quasi-servitude, maybe even slavery state. And so when these crowds are crying out to Jesus to be their king, they're specifically saying, we want you to overthrow Rome and set up things to be much better for us. And the second clue is not just this little phrase in John 12, 13 at the end, but also the very thing that they're waving in the air, the palm branches. Now that palm branch, we've talked about it here before, but in those days, that was the symbol of revolution. It was like the the revolutionary flag that they would wave as a Jewish community. It's what they waved during the Maccabee Revolt. Actually, this is a coin that they minted during the second Jewish revolt, about 100 years after the life of Jesus. But what they would do is take the Roman coins that were in circulation, flatten them out, and then imprint them or press them with their own design. And they would include these palm branches. And it was a very clear sign. We are erasing Roman rule, and we are putting our own stamp of the revolution, the palm, on this coin. So they have very high expectations for what Jesus will do to come in and overthrow the rulership of the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. But what was their experience? Well, During that week that Jesus spent in Jerusalem, he displayed very little interest in their agenda for him. Not particularly concerned about overthrowing the Roman military. Moreover, when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he refused to exercise power, military or supernatural or anything else, to stop them from arresting him. This was deeply disappointing to these crowds who had an agenda for Jesus. And eventually it led them to that point of decision when Pilate offered them the release of Jesus with whom Pilate could find no fault or the release of Barabbas who was a noted revolutionary, an insurrectionist, one of those who by violence sought to overthrow Rome. And you remember the choice of the crowds, the same who had greeted Jesus with adulation and expectation, now cried out, crucifixion, crucify him. And so this is the equation of their disappointment. Palm-waving hopes of revolution and military overthrow. 
Mine is an experience of shameful death at the hands of Rome. Overwhelming disappointment for these crowds. So what about us? How do we deal well with disappointment in such a way that we don't walk away from Jesus, don't reject Jesus, don't find ourselves preferring the release of someone whose military might is so persuasive at the expense of Jesus? What do we do with that? How do we deal with disappointment? Now, the common strategy, the common strategy to dealing with disappointment is to first lower your expectations and to second, do everything you can to maximize your experience. If you're dealing with disappointment, the most common response is just to lower your expectations and then do everything you can to maximize your experience. So right now, if you're dealing with some disappointment about the current situation being at home, a common response would be just to lower the expectations out of this time. Well, we're stuck at home. It's going to be hard. So let's, let's just, I mean, let's just try to survive it. And then what can we add? Anything just to make it vaguely tolerable. Let's just sort of hunker down and tune in to a show that we can binge watch that'll get us through. Now, don't get me wrong. We've watched our share of shows these last few weeks, and I anticipate we will watch some more. But the point I'm making is that the common response for people dealing with disappointment is simply to abdicate and medicate. But if that's sort of the common strategy, what's the Christian strategy? Is it any different? And that's where things get interesting because the Christian strategy is something else entirely. If you pay attention to Jesus on Palm Sunday, he tells those of us with ears to hear how to deal with these kind of disappointments. I just want to show you a grid really fast because this is very important, not just for this Sunday, but for what's ahead. Uh, This basic graph shows... The typical emotional response to a disaster. And this grid, it comes from the Institute for Collective Trauma and Growth. But on the left-hand side, you can see the disaster occurring. And right off the bat, our natural response is to be heroes. We can overcome this. That's week one. Then weeks two through eight, we may come down off of that heroic response, but there's still sort of this honeymoon period. We'll make the best of it. It's been a disaster, but we can overcome it. We can do this and this and this and this and this. But then you see there that deep trough of disillusionment, and that's months two through 36. Typically, people go into a pretty dark and long valley of disappointment when they realize that their heroic actions and their honeymoon outlook is not sufficient to overcome the pain and the damage that's been wrought by the disaster. And it's really only after an extended period of time there begins to come this restoration. And so it's quite likely, given all the things that are changing, all the things that are getting canceled, all the businesses that are going under and all the rest with COVID-19. All all the people are getting sick. And probably at this point, you are now at least one or maybe two relationships removed from somebody who's got COVID-19 and and maybe even know some people who've been hospitalized or or maybe you're even aware of, of some people who have died because of it and complications related to it. We are living through a pretty significant unprecedented, disaster kind of moment. And so if the research holds, it is likely that even if you're not currently dealing with disappointment and some disillusionment, or your expectations, your experience are not matching up, you will. So what does Jesus have to say to us on this crucial, crucial issue? A little bit later in the passage, there have been some Greeks 
non-Jewish people who are there in Jerusalem. They've come to see Jesus and they want to hear from Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus responds to their visit with very interesting little sermon. Starting there in verse 27. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus wrestling with the coming crucifixion. I mean, he's there. The crowds are adoring him. He can sense the disappointment that's coming for them. He can feel it himself, the tribulation ahead in his own life, the suffering on the cross. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered, and others said an angel has spoken to him. So clearly not everyone who hears the noise from heaven, interprets it rightly. Then verse 30, Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus, in the midst of people with huge expectations that he will be this king who will overthrow Rome, does not pursue the common strategy and say, oh, no, no, actually just lower your expectations. No, Jesus raises the expectations. Look at what he says. I have come to judge the world and the ruler of this world will be cast out and when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus says, no, 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 no. The emperor, the Roman empire, that's small potatoes. Your expectations are actually too low in this circumstance. What's happening right now with me coming to Jerusalem? I am overthrowing the ruler of this world. I'm overthrowing sin and Satan and death itself. I'm going after the deeper enemy. Jesus does not say, oh, lower your expectations. Jesus actually raises them. Jesus is not doing less than they hoped. He's doing far more. And I think this point is so important. Because so often, and we've said this here before, but so often when it seems like God is not meeting your expectations, it's because he is in the process of exceeding them. I want to say that one more time. So often when it seems like God is not meeting your expectations, it's because he's in the process of exceeding them. Too often our disappointment is because our expectations are too low. Jesus invites the crowds. Jesus is inviting us. Not to deal with disappointment by lowering our expectations, but actually by raising our expectations. God, what are you doing that may be deeper than I see right now? What's the the bigger enemy that you're overcoming? What is the victory that you're pursuing? And even in this time with the COVID-19, it's not a time for us to lower expectations. It's a time for us as the people of God to raise our expectations. God, what are you doing? God, what are you bringing about? Yeah, sure, lots of trends are toward sickness and recession. And our expectations could go right down with the stock market. But, but Lord, what are you doing in this time? Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Say it with me at home. Great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. But there's a second part. Not only does Jesus invite the crowds to raise their expectations, Jesus also challenges them to redefine how they rate their experience. We've talked about disappointment being expectation minus experience. Jesus is challenging them and challenging us to redefine the way we rate our experience. 
He does it by riding a donkey. Most people think that the best experience in that time would have been riding a noble war horse. But Jesus, and Jesus demonstrates a different way. Jesus gets on a humble donkey. And we have it right there in the text, but Zechariah 9 is the prophecy that helps us to interpret why Jesus gets on this donkey. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. High expectations, but a new way of rating or understanding the experience. Jesus is demonstrating the path of humility here. And Jesus is saying that, that our experience is actually not what brings us the most momentary pleasure, but actually what leads us in the way of humility because in that way of humility, true joy and true peace is discovered. And Jesus teaches this right here in this passage. Jesus answered them in verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So Jesus on a donkey showing us a different way to live, to evaluate our experience. And there are a lot of humbling moments being at home these days. There are a lot of humbling experiences in our restricted movement. There, there are a lot of humbling realities in our checking accounts and in our jobs. And normally we would rate those as miserable, negative. I had high expectations, but what I'm experiencing right now is humble, low, rotten, difficult. But Jesus says, actually, that way of humility, that's the true experience of the kingdom of God because it's when the seed falls to the ground, low, falls to the earth and dies, that's when new life begins. On the other side of that humility is the real resurrection power that these people are craving deep down. The resurrection power that jolted Lazarus back to life. And the resurrection power that will flow through Jesus beyond the cross. The resurrection power that is promised and delivered through the Holy Spirit. And the resurrection power that will be enacted when Jesus returns. That's what we crave, but the way to that experience is through humility, surrender, love, service. And Jesus says, raise your expectations. Redefine the way you rate your experience. And this is why in other parts of the New Testament, we find these otherwise confusing kind of statements like James 1-2. Count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials of all kinds. What? No, no, no. The way I would rate, rate that experience of trials is not pure joy. It's like pure misery. But James has redefined the way. He rates these experiences. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. Why? Because he's, he's riding on a humble donkey. He's taking the low way. He's falling to the earth. He's surrendering his love for his life in this world for the sake of God's promised power. Even Jesus would teach it in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when people revile you, persecute you, say all sorts of false things about you. Blessed are you. Listen, we rate those experiences when people say something negative on our social media feed or we hear about some gossip about us. We tend to rate those experiences as horrible. I expected it to be much better. My experience was very low. Scripture says, no, no, no. Blessed are you when that happens. 
Because in those moments, you are especially near to Jesus. You're especially near to the Lord of life, the Lord of resurrection. Now I know this is a challenging teaching, so I just want to share one last nugget from John chapter 12 with you that has been so encouraging to me. It's verse 16. It says, Jesus' disciples did not understand these things at first. (laughs) How often have you been in a trying and disappointing season and you could say that? I did not understand these things. There's a lot about what's happening right now. I do not understand. People say, why is this happening? Why why is there a a pandemic? Well, I do not understand these things, but if you don't understand these things, you're in pretty good company. The disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Last thought. God takes time to work things out. And we take time to figure things out. Don't be too quick to yield to disappointment. But hear Jesus' challenge. Raise your expectations of what's possible in this season. Raise your expectations of what God might be doing in this season. And then redefine the way you rate your experience. Yes, things are different. But dare we follow in the way of Jesus, humble, serving, maybe even sacrificial. This is the path. This is the way that Jesus shows us. This is the way that the grace of God empowers us. So often we have an agenda for God's grace and power in our lives. And it leads to disappointment. We want to see the grace and power of God in our lives. This is the way. Jesus riding in on a donkey. Showing us. It's through crucifixion that resurrection power erupts. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these words. I know all around Everyone tuned in. We're all dealing with disappointments of various kinds. And so, God, we ask you to give us grace, not to surrender or yield or lower our expectations, Lord, but help us to see what you're doing. The disciples couldn't understand it in the moment, Lord, and and we, frankly, we don't understand it all the time either. But help us to remember and understand and interpret. And, Lord, transform us. Transform us in our souls, in our hearts, by your power and by your grace. Transform us that we might agree with you when you said it is better to give than to receive. That we might delight, delight in the opportunities to lay our lives down because we know that it's through that surrender you bring about the great expectations you've had all along. In the name of Jesus, amen. Jesus, our Lord, your firm foundation, there can be no other, there can be no other. You speak your name and we see salvation, there can be no there can be no
are the truth, Lord. You are the way. You are the life. And we are amazed. There's no other hope. Cause no other name can save us. There can be no other. You are the truth. Amen. This week, it's Holy Week, so we'll be talking to you about the journey of Jesus to the cross on a daily basis, but also expect for us to begin the transition from adjusting to being at home to now investing. We're going to be offering webinars on Wednesday in some areas that we've heard would be helpful to you, so keep your eyes out for those. Tuesday evening, we're going to shift our Zoom time to be a time of intercession and prayer for our community and for our nation. Thursday evening, we're going to have some live worship together, making space online. And through all of that, through all of that, we are making this shift from adjustment to investment, what's possible in this time. But before we sign off, I encourage you, where you are, open up your hands as I speak this word of blessing over you. And now, May the Lord Jesus deliver you from disappointment. May he 
raise your expectations to align with his. And may he lead you deeper and more fully into the way of joy found amidst sacrifice and humility. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, peace be with us all.